Welcome to Cover to Cover Bookbeat. I'm your host, Roger Nichols. Back when the Godfather movies came out, they created larger-than-life figures and built myths around the mafia, Cosa Nostra, or whatever you want to call organized crime. When Goodfellas came along, it gave a grittier version of the life. But for the straight dope on the mob, then what it's really like, you have to consult our guest, Scott M. Hoffman. He was a witness to historical events concerning major mob families. He learned the inner workings from his dad, who loyally served the outfit, as they called it, for over 55 years and never spent a day in prison. Mr. Hoffman is a native of Chicago. He is a graduate of Long Island University, Brooklyn, with a BA in journalism, one of our boys and made good. For 35 years, he worked for the city of Chicago in the departments of purchasing and finance. Inside is the name of his book. It is his first published book, and we are very pleased to welcome Scott Hoffman. Good morning. Good morning, Roger, and good morning to your viewers. I'm really fascinated with this book. Uh, so many questions. It, it's pretty obvious to start with. The Hoffman is not an Italian name. So while your father could serve the outfit, no. as you call it, he could never be a made man. Is that the way it works? That's correct. Because to be a made, made man, you have to be Italian 100% on both sides, mm -hmm. mother and father, and really uh, grandmother, grandfather. So you have to be uh, Italian on both sides. Okay. And it's yeah. uh, kind of interesting because uh, 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 black hands, uh, which were extortionists in the 20s and 30s and later on, and they were all Sicilians, and they would tolerate, from what my father would say, Northern Italians, but never wanted to put them in any position of authority. They wouldn't accept them for that. So it was quite a differential, uh, you know, concerning non-Italians. Interesting aspect of it. Now, the book's written as a novel with your viewpoint character, Bobby Williams, standing in for you and his father, Jimmy Williams, standing in for your father. How long did you have to think about the wisdom of sharing some of these stories, even disguised as they are? Well, you know, when I retired from the city of Chicago, as all retirees, you need some activity. You need to keep your mind and also your body alert. And yeah. I knew, I thought about what was the subject that I knew the best about? And this was the subject I knew the best about. So I retired on June 30th, 2012. And on July 3rd, uh, 2012, I started writing 7.30 in the morning to 8.30 in the morning. As my book turned out to be 880 handwritten pages. I don't know how to do it on the computer. But as I, I'm writing it, everything is coming back to me from 50, maybe 60 years, close to 60 years. It's just like it's happening right now, right in front of me. So it wasn't something where I had to make a lot of notes and look back. I, I, everything was, I, the recall was coming back very quickly. How long did it take you to write the book once you decided to do so? 800 written, handwritten pages takes a bit of time. Yes, it does. It was about two years, a little over two years. Because mm -hmm. that was the draft, and then I had to rewrite it after going through the draft. So it was a little over two years. Yeah. Most of the authors I talk to say it isn't the writing, it's the rewriting that makes the novel. So um, and what's been the reaction? I'm sure there are people who knew your father's connections and yours to him. Were there any concerns about that? No, not really, because as I tell people, either they're dead or they're in jail or they can't read. <laughs> so it's, uh, uh, you know, most, most of the people, there are very, very few people left that would, uh, you know, say, no, my father. And uh, of course, because of, uh, you know, the, the uh, G or as, as, it, as the government is called, I have no involvement with them, though I hear things on the mob grapevine, but I have no involvement because of continuous investigations on these guys. And uh, it's something you not, do not be part of. I have to ask about, because there are some pretty stressful things that take place for Bobby in the book, and I assume that they mirror things that happen in your life, including seeing the first killing at age nine on the ninth birthday. Is that, does that yes. really happen? Yes, and, and that wasn't even really so much, a, it wasn't even a mob related killing. It had to do with uh, uh, Sam Giancana, a banker gave him bad financial advice and the banker was the one who wound up being killed. And yeah, it was on my ninth birthday and uh, the, after the shooting took place, uh, the mobster who did the shooting, 
they used a 22 with a silencer and he gives me the silencer and the driver said, are you sure you really want to do it? And he says, well, he's got to learn. We'll give him a birthday present. He told me to get rid of the silencer. So I put it in my pocket and the next day I wrap it up in a newspaper and I take it to a dumpster. I didn't know really what to do. And it was about four o'clock in the morning when I did all this before school. And I come back home, put the key in the door because I was a responsible kid. So they gave me a key, you know, I had to wear around your neck. Okay. And my father is standing there and he says, uh, how was your birthday present? And I said, well, it was kind of scary. He says, did you get rid of it? I says, yeah. I didn't know how to take it apart, which is really what you should do with a silencer. Huh. You know, you take it apart. But at nine years old, I didn't, I didn't know. And as I tell people, you have to remember, I still have a nine-year-old's brain. I don't have an adult's brain. Mm -hmm. They can figure things out as an adult would be able to. There is another kind of gross thing that took place when you were 12, a, a decapitation. That's pretty scary. Yeah. Well, but, yeah. well, before that, at 11, I saw a guy's hands cut off. Okay, he owed money. So uh -huh. I was with juice collectors. And at 12, it was the same, same guy who cut the guy's hands off at 11, decapitated the guy at, uh, when I was 12. And it was, again, because of owing money. Wow. You know, we, the first thing you learn in mob life or in the life, as it's called, is the first conversation of the day is about money. The last conversation of the day is about money. So everything is always about money. And uh, if you don't come up with the money at a specific time, then things are going to start happening. But it was, you know, like I said, it was very scary to me because I'm still a child in an adult criminal world seeing these type of things. And when I'd come home, uh, I was always hoping someone would just put their arm around me and say, Scott, tomorrow's going to be a better day. Don't worry, it's going to be okay. But that never really happened. As my father's approach with me was he wanted me to see everything and you know, then make up my own decision if I wanted to go into life. He didn't force me, but it, like a sports team, we went over all the details of everything that I was going to be seeing over and over and over again. He wanted me to react automatically. Uh -huh. And that must have changed you, I, I would have to think. Oh, it was very hard because I had to assimilate with my classmates in my formal education and kids in the neighborhood. And so, of course, you're not able to tell anybody about what, what's going on in your life. I didn't have any birthdays. I didn't have a bicycle. My father never took me to a baseball game. You know, my life was based on what I'm seeing in, in the criminal life of organized crime. But it was very difficult because, you know, like I say, when you're in class and everything with kids, you want to be part of the class. Mm -hmm. And I tried my best to be part, but I had to keep separate. It was almost like I was leading two different lives. It was difficult. Yeah. I have to ask about your mother in this. Um, I'm sure she must have at least suspected, but did she ever let that on to you? Well, my father told my mother before what his life was about. Mm. So she knew what it was about. And she told him to keep it out of the house. In other words, no meetings in the house, mm. which he did. He, he would talk to me but he never had other mobsters in the house. He'd meet with them in a cemetery. He'd meet with them in churches. He'd meet with them in uh, park district gymnasiums because he was never comfortable in a restaurant. He always felt there'd be a bug that uh, the G would put a bug under the table wow. for electronic listening. So, and he would use pay phones to talk to people. So yeah, she kind of knew, you know, she knew, but um, she accepted the life and he was good to her. I mean, Whatever my mother would tell myself or my sister, you'd always say, what did your mother tell you? That's what you do. Smart man. And to be able to be in the life for that time and stay out of uh, prison, he must yeah. have not been, in, uh, uh, how shall we say, part of the active work of the, of the organization. Yeah, he was, well, his whole thing was, he'd always tell me this, you want to be three steps ahead of people. And I said, Dad, isn't it two steps? He said, no, if it's two steps and you lose a step, you're right in the range. But they can <laughs> grab you, do something. So you always got to remember, you want to be the hunter. You never want to be the game. And he would always say, as far as uh, the FBI and, and uh, U.S. Marshal's office, he said, they make a move, I make a move. He was never hateful against law enforcement, though we had a lot of law enforcement on the payroll with 
corrupt politicians, corrupt judges, because what the public doesn't know is that uh, street enforcers and juice collectors get half the money they bring in. Mm. And this is why they'd be very aggressive on their collections, but they're getting half. So we had a Chicago, we had 50 Chicago police officers, 30 that were active officers, and 20 that were uh, had either quit the job or were fired from the job. And besides a, a police salary for those active police officers, they would get half of what they bring in, and they were used. We also had Illinois State Police on the payroll, Cook County Sheriff's deputy, and we had two FBI agents that were on the payroll. They were needed. Everybody else was known as as needed. But the FBI, two agents, yeah, they were needed and they provided information. Wow. I, I noticed that through, I took a lot of notes as I, I read the book, which is I, my habit. And there was a lot of advice that your father gave you, or at least Jimmy did to Bobby in the book. And I assume that they're, that's for, for real stuff. Yes. And, yes. and one of the, one of the things that you emphasize over and over is having to make the play when the play has to be made. I think that's yeah, yeah. That Tell was very that. tandem. What, what, what? What he meant by that was, when an opportunity, when you see an opportunity that can help you, do not sit there and wait on it. Don't think about it, because that you might only get one opportunity in your life. Mm -hmm. So make the move on something when you need to make the move. In other words, if you say in your case, Roger, if you, you meet a nice girl, don't wait and start thinking about it. Make yeah. that move. Stay with her, you know. And so don't hold back. He was never he never believed in holding back. He said too many people will tell you, oh, I'll get back to you and think about it, and then they won't do it. And then later on in life they'll be complaining. Well, I had an opportunity. And my father would look him in the face and says, Then why didn't you take it? Why didn't you make the play when the play had to be made? And that carried over into his mob life. I mean, he fixed professional boxing. He fixed uh, horse racing, the last three horse races at Washington Park. Okay, so it was all beyond. And as I tell people, every mob family has a rule. Cops and kids are off limits. But that didn't apply to me because the outfit at its height was bringing in $200 million a year from all their illegal activities, 100 million of the year was coming from Las Vegas. And the Las Vegas money was not only the casinos. My father was getting money, a percentage of the companies, the ancillary companies, you know, the linen company, the food company. Mm -hmm. And also he set up um, well, what he referred to as off street betting with bookies. Mm -hmm. And you'd have people that would bet with bookies who didn't want to bet in a uh, you know, sports bar because if they win so much money, obviously, they got to report it as earned income. But with a bookie, you're not reporting. If you win, you're not reporting any earned income. It's just you got to have the money when you need the money. But that was another source of income. So it wasn't just that's one thing when you watch movies. And I had to go back and watch these movies. Uh, they don't always stress. You know, they make it look like, wow, it's all casino money. No. And even how the hotels were set up, he set them up with private investors because to get a gaming license in the Nevada Gaming Commission, they wouldn't give it to a mobster, but the uh, outfit would run the casino and take their skim. And the other guys would be told, you know, the owners would be told, you bring in, hosp you know, people that know how to run hotels. He would mm -hmm. always emphasize that. He said, you're a successful businessman in your business, but you don't know how to run hotels. Don't think you're the smartest guy in the room. Bring in hotel people. And they ran the hotels. And whoever was running the casino every day would talk to the hotel guy and say, how are things going? Do you have any problem? Let me know. You know, they would work with them. But he was very emphasized that quite a bit because he'd always tell me, he says, Scott, when you want to run a successful operation, you bring in the people that know what they're doing. Don't try to be a jack of all trades and master of none. And uh, he learned that. I learned that in Las Vegas and in the rest of his life and things he did. Fascinating. He also another piece that I really think is applied to anybody he says the first day you run from a problem, you'd be running the rest of your life. So face things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It was. It would, it would say that he said. He says he would say that not every answer is the answer you're going to want, but you have to get an answer on it. Otherwise, you're going to run around and be a, a scared chicken your whole life. 
-hmm. Okay. He'd, he'd always say that. And, you know, it's just like he never liked politicians at all because we had, he'd always tell me that whether it's Democrat, Republican, they're just labels. He said, because they take the envelope with, with uh, unhappy Ben Franklin in there. And when I'd ask him, what do you mean by unhappy Ben Franklin? He said, Scott, if you had to give your money away to these guys, would you be happy? Because whenever you look at the picture of Ben Franklin on the $100 bill, he's not smiling. And uh, so then I'd ask him, I'd say, well, are there any clean politicians in Illinois? Which is not really true. And he would say to me, he would say, yes, there are. And I was surprised. as dad, there, there's clean politicians in Illinois? And he'd say, yeah, the ones that don't get caught. Those are the clean ones. He said, the ones that get caught, they're not clean. So when I'd ask him, why do we vote? He'd say, well, we have to get our crooks in to take care of us, because if the other guys get their crooks in, they're not going to take care of us. So then we're nearing the end of the conversation. And he says to me, got to always remember, with politics, you go in as a whore, you come out as a prostitute. And then he would say, the faces change, but the nonsense remains the same. So he had a very disdain for politicians, because he had, like I say, he had to deal with them on corrupt issues and pay them to get things done. They were always our friends. Everybody was always your friend. Uh -huh. Everyone was always referred to as a friend. One of the things I like, interesting style in the book, it's almost a stream of consciousness thing, as one of the reviewers pointed out. And there are not chapters, but there are real stories in here that have beginnings and ends and whatnot, but it just kind of flows. Was was that your intent or, or did it just come yes. out that way? Yeah. Yeah, no, I didn't want, I didn't want, I wanted people to cut it off where they felt they wanted to cut it off. Mm -hmm. Because it, being in the life was a continuous story, obviously, of, you know, the things I was seeing. So I wanted people to have that opportunity. If they wanted to stop, they would stop. Because that's what the life was. It was never uh, just one type of story or one thing occurring. It was things happening at a fast and furious pace and a lot and a lot of things. So I wanted people to get that flow, to get that understanding. And I've had people tell me, well, you can make a movie from this. And I said, yes, I know that. But just getting someone interested in it, because you could even break it up and take the individual stories and make movies from them. Mm -hmm. So that's why I did that. And uh, people have liked it. Uh, you know, I, I haven't really had anybody dislike it. And then someone said to me, I sa said, well, Scott, I don't think they want to tell you. They're probably afraid to tell you they don't like it. I said, no, nothing will happen to him. Don't worry. It'll be okay. Oh, great. I have to I, I admire one of the things I, I do collect is really nifty turns of phrases. And you have several in If you don't mind, I'll quote a couple of them for you. Yeah. One, one of them I liked was, when depression walks in the door, it buys stupid. And that just seems like so obvious in retrospect, but it's the first time I, I thought that. And I thought, okay, there's an observation we can live with. And the other one had to do with, with uh, playing cards close to your chest and you say you wore the cards. So it, it just is a whole different way of thinking about things. And I really appreciate that fresh approach to things. So congratulations. Well, that's, you know, you. my father, Roger, my father would always, you know, we went over personalities of people. Mm -hmm. That was another thing, which was a life experience in that respect. In other words, we would talk about the guy who wants to be the joker, the clown, the guy mm -hmm. who is maybe the backstabber, the one you tell at work about a, something, an idea you're thinking, and he runs into the boss and makes it like it's his idea and he gets the promotion. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the moody guy, the one who can't handle the alcohol. But he'd always tell me this, Scott, always remember of all the personalities you're going to meet in your life, there's one personality you always watch, always watch this person. And that's the quiet one, because he'd say mm -hmm. you don't know what the quiet one is thinking. Everybody else, you'll hear through their mouth. You'll hear what they're talking. You know right away what they are, what type of personality they are. But the quiet one that just sits there, that's the one you got to watch. I have to ask this. Was there a lot of stuff you felt you had to leave out in recounting this? Well, there was, there was, two, really, there was two really main things. Uh, I had to water one down, and that was the one where uh, when I was 12 years old, I'm going with a juice collector and he's looking for a guy and we meet his wife and she's pregnant. Oh, and she was very, pregnant, yeah. very advanced. And I had to water down what actually really happened because I always had this feeling that I didn't think an audience 
could stomach it, that they would get nauseous if they found out what physically really happened to her, okay? And so that had to be watered down. And the other thing was what they would do to dogs. That was another thing. See, if, oh. if a guy owed money and uh, they saw the dog in the backyard, they'd come back at another time, say maybe with a tranquilizer gun and uh, you know tranquilize the dog and then go in and chop the dog up in pieces. Oh. Or else they'd throw in meat with uh, quite a bit of poison to kill the dog. Yeah. And then they would tell the guy, well, it's better your dog than your kid, right? Uh -huh. you know, not, I'm not saying they'd always go after the kid, but it was to scare the guy. Because like my father would always say, we work on two premises. We work on intimidation, or we work on power, which is from the money we have that can manipulate people. And I would see that quite a bit, especially the manipulation of people with the money. Mm -hmm. Were you ever tempted to join the life? Well, you know, of course, what I'm seeing was always was always made it interesting to me in that sense. But as I got a little bit older, especially in the teenage years, which I was already a hardened veteran of, of mob life, I could see more of the consequences that were occurring. And I, I, I remember when I was in college uh, and I worked mob social clubs, I had gotten an academic scholarship, but I had to uh, work to come up with room and board at Long Island University, which is in downtown Brooklyn. And so I worked Colombo, I worked Lucchese, and I worked Bonanno. And Lucchese is where I, I worked the bar owned by Henry Hill of Goodfellas. So I knew all the real Goodfellas. I knew all the real Sopranos. I knew a lot, a lot of mob families in the East, East Coast. And the one thing you learned, and I would come home, and this was in, oh, March of 1970. I was home on spring break. And the next month in April of 1970 was when the RICO Act was going to become officially the RICO Act. Oh, yeah. and that was written by uh, a professor. I think his name was Robert Blakely from Notre Dame University for Congress. And so I talked to my father. I said, what is this thing with RICO? And uh, he said to me, Scott, he said, in years to come, the rats are going to be jumping off the ship. The, the, the Code of Omerta, bye-bye, he would say which is the code of silence. You're not going to see that. He's maybe with some guys, but guys are going to be jumping off the ship because especially the older guys, they're not going to want to do 85% of their time or longer, you know. So you could see things, the consequences. When I was 10 years old, uh, the G, the FBI came and they arrested my father and there, and, and there were six agents, three of them took him uh, downtown for questioning. And he told my mother, call the lawyer. And the other three were just looking for documents. They were throwing stuff on the floor because, you know, I was up with my sister and, uh, you know, they weren't, it wasn't clean. They didn't just look through a drawer and then leave it alone. They're dumping stuff on the, on the floor, kicking it around, pushing it around. That's how they leave it. So when you see these things, you realize, do you really want that type of life? Okay. Do you really want to put yourself in that situation? Because my father would always say, the life is a two-shouldered operation. One shoulder, you're looking over somebody who might want to whack you, or the other term was give him his receipt, which I jokingly tell people if you're in a store and the clerk says, do you want your receipt? You, no, you get your feet going and get out of that store quick. You never want to get your receipt because that's telling someone to kill you. And the other thing, the other shoulder would be that the government, the G was after mm -hmm. you. So mm -hmm. it was a pressurized, very pressurized business. There's one thing that in, in some of your material, it's not in the book, but I have to ask about what you said when you met Marilyn Monroe. Yes. Norma oh. Jean Masterson. Yes. Yeah. It was February. It was uh, March of 1961. It was in the a Blackstone Hotel, which is still in business today. But that was one of the downtown uh, places that was used for mob uh, prostitution just on Saturdays, so only on Saturdays. I'm sure the current owners will be surprised that their lovely Blackstone Hotel was used. And she was, uh, at that point, she had been in New York in 1961. Uh, and that was, she was doing a premiere. And that was her last movie, The Misfits. Mm -hmm. And she was with, uh, also Clark Gable was in the movie. And a few months after filming, he died of a heart attack. But in January, it's actually January 25th, the screenwriter, who was a famous playwright, Arthur Miller, who was her husband, they got divorced. And uh, she went with him for the premiere in New York. He did go with her at that point. But yeah, we met and we talked. And my father would say, well, ask her about her life. He knew about her life. And she had a very difficult life. 
because her mother was uh, a, 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 in a sane asylum all the time because she was uh, classified documented, you know, by doctors as having a, a personality issue problem, okay, as a schizophrenic. So when she, she told me when she was born, she was actually put in a foster home as a baby. And oh. for 12 consecutive foster homes, she was in and that she was in an orphanage. So my father, the reason he wanted me to do ask, he said, because I know you really, you see a tough life, you see bad things, but there's always somebody who's got it worse. He told me that later. There's always somebody who got it worse. So she would ask me, she says, well, how old are you? And I said, well, I'm 12 and a half. Because, you know, at, at a certain age, you always throw that half. half in. In, yeah. You never say 15 years. It's always a half. And she says, yeah, 12 and a half going on 40. That's what you're doing. She said, you've lived a thousand lives, haven't you? I said, maybe a thousand one. But we spoke for a little over an hour, I would say. Fascinating. Fascinating indeed. What do you hope that people take away from the book when they're done? Well, to realize that it's, first of all, it's not a glamorous profession. It's not something that someone should go into unless they, you know, want to have the various consequences that can occur from the life. And that to understand that there's more to it than what a, a movie or show is because they do it for entertainment which is obvious and they do a great job obviously but they never give you the full picture they're never showing you other things that um, are involved in the life and some of these other things people would would not want to be a part of you know they wouldn't want to do it. i mean we had almost 350 members in the outfit plus other mob families who reported but not everybody was a shooter not everybody could kill somebody it was a hardcore group. My father would use them, but they'd be doing other things. But you, again, you don't always see that because of the limit of time in a movie or a television mm -hmm. show. You see what's entertaining, yeah. okay? Like the real Soprano family, the De Calcavante family. They're a very dysfunctional family, okay? And one of the things that happened in that family, my father had this authority too as a consigliere, is that you have the right... If the, if the family is not going good, the street crew is not working well, if there's problems that a consigliere can remove the capo from the street crew. Either he can do it himself or he can have someone do the shooting. But obviously, if you tell someone, hey, I want a Roger Nichols whacked, he's going to run to Roger Nichols and tell him and what's going to happen to Scott Hoffman, okay? Yeah. So my father never did it, but in the De Calcavante family, the guy's name was John, John D'Amico. He was a, a capo. And the reason, and I talk about gay, gay people, of course, in my book, I mentioned that uh, he was gay. And as far as the mob life goes, a boss cannot be gay, okay? It's not accepted. Now, if a, if a soldier or a street crew guy is gay and he's a good earner, they'll tell him, keep it off the street. Keep it off the street. They won't like it, but he's a good earner. He's bringing in the money. But a boss, it's never accepted. And what happened to D'Amico was his consigliere killed him. And several decades later, was arrested and tried and convicted for the murder. So, it, you know, it happens. I mean, Tony Accardo, who became uh, the consigliere of the whole outfit, not just a uh, individual group. When he, I remember when he removed, you know, Sam Giancana. And he, he told me his time was up. And I remember that meeting. So there was, you know, there was a lot of things, like I said, that go on that uh, if people knew, they wouldn't, they wouldn't want to be involved. Yeah. That, and I wouldn't that, want them involved. I appreciate that a great deal. Is there anything we haven't touched on you want to make sure the audience hears? Well, the only thing, the only thing I would say is this, that um, oftentimes, Mob life looks like something it really isn't. And there's, there's oftentimes people might think that people get along with people. And that's not always the case. There's always a lot of people who don't get along, and that causes problems. Uh, one of the things that my father did when Tony Accardo took over in 1943, they set up the street crews. And they allowed uh, the capo to have his own consigliere, his own underboss, which is the same as far as an organizational chart, they're the same. And my father did that because he said, the younger guys, you have to give them a, an opportunity to grow somewhere. Otherwise they're gonna create their own positions 
if you let them create their own, they're going to start killing people. You're going to have a lot of bodies showing up on the street. So you try you try to open it up that way. And also a made guy, the one thing is a made guy is like a union guy. He's got all these rights. You can't do anything to a made guy. And there was a Genovese guy whose son, son's name was Eddie, was about 25 years old, was in a club and got into a fight with a uh, guy who was made from, I think, the Gambino family. And it was over a woman, of course, you know, and they were drinking. And uh, Eddie's father was told that he had to give the order on his son. Okay. So, so he had to give the order on his son. And that's one thing my father would tell me. He would say, Scott, don't ever do anything because if I, ha if I have to give the order, I'm going to give the order. So don't ever put yourself in that position. He said, if a cop gives you a ticket, just take the ticket. We'll take care of it later. Don't get, in, don't get into any beefs with anybody that could be harmful, especially if you know they're a wise guy or have a, you know, wise guys in the family, any mob family. Just always keep it straight. That's great. That's, that's great advice anytime. Yeah. 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 So that's the one thing you learned that there's no guarantee. No guarantees at all. Uh, our guest has been Scott Hoffman. The book is inside. Let's tell people where they can find it. Sure. If you go on Amazon and put in Scott S C O T T, middle initial M, last name Hoffman, H O F F M A N and the word inside the title, you will see the book. It's, made, it's a paperback and it's also Kindle. I've had people you know, buy it, Kindle, of course. Mm -hmm. So either way, but you will see it, it will come up. It, it is, and it is a powerful read. Uh, it, it's, it's not a short book. It'll take you some time to get through it. And sometimes you have to put it down for a while, I will say that, because it, you just have to absorb some of it. But it's fascinating. Really appreciate it. Our, our, Guest again is Scott Hoffman. The book is Inside. Thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you very much, Roger, and thank uh, your listeners for also for listening to me. Thank you very much.